Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hayes' Higher Learning. My name is Ashley Hayes, and this week on the Higher Learning Podcast, we are going to talk about a book called The Five Levels of Attachment, which is written by Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. He's the son of Don Miguel, who wrote The Four Agreements. And so in an earlier episode, I mentioned that one of the most life-changing philosophies that I've adapted is the Buddhist philosophy that the root of all suffering is attachment. And there are so many sorts of attachment that cause us suffering, including attachments to people, ideas, beliefs, and particular outcomes. And so after reading the four agreements, I immediately went and got the five levels of attachment. And so to set up the discussion on attachment, Don Miguel Jr. writes that when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we often hear a narrative in our mind of what we see, a definition of self in the form of identity that is based on our agreements the thoughts and beliefs that we have said yes to. This identity stems from ideological beliefs that have come to us over a period of time, from our family, culture, religion, education, friends, and beyond. So, for example, to try to clear that up, because that was a mouthful, (laughs) um, when I look in the mirror, I see Ashley Hayes, an African-American woman, a poet, a sister, a daughter, etc. And with all of these identities, though, comes the attachment to beliefs about what they look like and what they mean. So for example, if someone takes the title of mother or father, they have in their mind what it should look like. And oftentimes, if you come short of that, you withdraw love from yourself because you think you're not good enough. And you feel like you must meet this expectation of what you believe this looks like in order to be worthy of your own love. And so this episode, we will work through how to accept who we are as we are and how to love ourselves beyond our attachments of what we think we should be. So if you remember in the four agreements, we talked about domestication and the process of being trained to fit into society. Once our parents are done domesticating us, we usually do a good job of domesticating ourselves into adulthood. And the primary tool used to domesticate oneself is judgment. We talked about judgment and emotional safety, and it's going to keep coming up. So when we perceive flaws and inadequacy in ourselves, we say we're not good enough. We say I'm not smart enough, attractive enough, Self-judgment resides where self-acceptance wishes to be. And Don Miguel writes that of all the beliefs to detach from, the most important thing is that you must obtain some image of perfection in order to be happy. Newsflash, you do not have to be perfect to be happy. You don't have to have everything figured out you're probably never going to have your shit together. We are always growing, always learning. And so if you think that you have to be a certain way in order to be happy, that is the attachment that I really want us to work on breaking. And we're often sold this image of perfection by the media. And it has, it only has power if you agree with the message. So if you agree that the women you see in commercials and on TV are beautiful, then that is what gives our idea of perfection power. And he goes on to write that you are perfect exactly as you are. And if you should wish to make changes, it should be because one, not because one day you hope to love yourself, but because you already love yourself. He writes, if we accept ourselves for who we are at this very moment, we change because we want to grow and evolve. And love is no longer the condition for love. It is the starting point for change. And this is the true meaning of unconditional love, changing because you want to and because you love yourself, not because you feel like you have to in order to be accepted. And so Don Miguel is from a group of people called the Toltec people of Mexico. And in Toltec tradition, they have this belief that life is a dream. They believe that every man dreams his own dream. And there's also a collective dream of the planet, things that we collectively want for ourselves, like shelter, love, um, good education. 
so many of us were sold this American dream, though. And when we decide that we don't want it, we often struggle with being rejected by people who we want love from. And he goes on to use the metaphor of birds flying to describe this. He says that who we are is a combination of our yeses and our noes. And in a flock of birds, um, they say yes to the leader and they follow him. And if he changes the direction, then they go. Sometimes, though, some say yes to a different bird and go another direction. Sometimes they reconnect. Sometimes they don't. He says in relationships, whoever controls the yes controls the relationship. Or whoever controls the yes in communities and politics and finance controls the dream of the planet. And this is why people often try to force their views on other people for control. Control is an addictive drug. And he says, um, we create harmony in relationships when we accept people's yeses and noes and respect them instead of trying to change them. Major key alert. And for me, manipulative and violent behavior is the ultimate marker of attachment. So we'll walk through the levels of attachment and get into how they show up and how to ultimately achieve harmonious relationships. So let's talk a little bit about dreams. Dreams are built on knowledge, and knowledge is how we survive the world. As our attachment to knowledge increases, it narrows our ability to perceive life as it truly is, thus narrowing our potential. So in other words, the more we have an idea of how something should be or the more we are attached to what we know about something, the more difficult it is to really see things as they are and not as we're judging them. So Don Miguel writes, if my attachment to what I know blinds me to all the available options, then my knowledge is controlling me. It is controlling my intention and it is creating my personal dream for me. But with awareness of my attachments comes the opportunity to take back that control and to live life as I choose, which I like to do. His work on knowledge goes on to talk about how we agree upon symbols. For example, if I ask you if you ate breakfast today, um, we have a general idea of what time you ate that meal and what group of foods might have been eaten. There's very little at stake if we agree that breakfast is before noon, although some people eat breakfast food after noon and I just I just don't get it. Um, However, there is a lot at stake if we bring our perceptions and points of view to collectively decide what symbols of like love and morality mean, right? The more people who agree with these certain ideas, the more the idea takes form. And with attachments, we only feel solid when our ideas and beliefs match the majority of individuals. In other words, when our ideas and beliefs are different from the majority, it can create a sense of insecurity. And generally, nobody comes into the world wanting to be the outcast. We want to belong, but we can't confuse belonging for fitting in or trying to fit in. And it's important to remember, though, that things like love and morality are concepts. They're not tangible things. So if one group of people decides what constitutes morality and immorality, it's still only a symbol of it or an illusion. It's not real. But what makes it seem real is the support of other people. And as that support grows, the attachments to those belief grows. Um, oftentimes we call this mob culture or cult culture. And while it seems like it's a solid definition because most people believe it or it's generally accepted, the definition is fragile because it relies on people's acceptance of it. And Don Miguel goes on to explain how the how this acceptance changes and forms society. So, for example, for a brief moment in history, tulips, the flowers, were more valuable than gold. And when the agreement about the tulips changed, the market crashed. But a tulip never stopped being a tulip. The financial worth was the illusion. And so the nature of these agreements is that their definition is subject to change. And when we look at it this way, we can see how fragile definitions and meanings and ideas really are. However, they hold a lot of power in our society, which is why people spend a lot of energy trying to prove their belief and to prove that their ideas are right. And you can become so attached to that idea that there becomes very little room for change or growth. He goes on to say that we have the freedom to decide for ourselves if those meanings reflect our experience in life. And by openly listening to other people's knowledge and experience without attachment to our own beliefs, then we can truly understand the world. 
And I think the biggest case um, for me is masculinity and femininity. In this society, we decide what it is collectively, and moreover, we decide which body should have it. And when people violate our ideas of what that should be, we see reactions ranging from people being super accepting, and these are the people who are the most unattached to their beliefs, to people being so attached to their beliefs about what masculinity and femininity should look like, that they are violent to people who challenge their idea of what that should be. And that is where the social justice lives in healing those attachments and healing our attachment to those ideas so that we can ultimately stop being violent to people who are different than us. And so those attachments usually affect people's sense of self. And so when we place ourselves in a safety zone where we feel comfortable and secure, then we sort of develop this, this is who I am and this is the way things are mentality for people who are attached to their ideas. And then the worst thing imaginable for people in that case is that that attachment or that ideal will go away. Because when you threaten it, when you threaten their sense of masculinity, then ultimately you affect their sense of self, where really they should be separate. Your sense of self and then your sense of what this thing should be are two totally independent things. And so Don Miguel Jr. uses the example of a kid whose identity is tied into where they go to school and the friends they have. Then one day their parents say that we're moving to another city and they panic and cry and they scream, this is my school, these are my friends, this is my house. But then they move and they make new friends and they get a new house and ultimately give up their attachment. But some people don't. Some people don't give up their attachment and then they act out in resistance to change. And throughout our lives, we experience changes that threaten our sense of identity. We move, we find new friends, we might lose a job, we might need need, leave a relationship. And so what I want for us is to have our identity separate from those things. And so Rui's really snatched my wig when he says, when I believe that something has to remain in its rightful place for me to be okay, I have become attached to it. And I have confused this external thing with who I am. Some people might need a minute here. I needed a minute there because I was confusing a lot of external things with who I am. And I spent a lot of time saying, well, I need this person to be a certain way or I need things to stay this way in order for me to be okay. When the reality is, is those things are going to be threatened all the time. Change is the only thing we're certain of. So then you have to develop a sense of identity that's independent of those things that shift day to day. And so an example of this is I'm a poet, right? And when Poetry Slam went under, some people's sense of self-identity and worth went with it. And some people in relationships, you let a partner take your sense of self and identity with them. I'm telling y'all, if my partner had left me even six months earlier, if that PSI stuff had went down even six months earlier, I don't even know that I would have recovered. Um, Because for so long, I listened to people tell me that my worth was tied into this thing that I did. I listened to the church tell women that they are only as worthy as the male attention they get. And if you believe that, then it really creates this fragile sense of identity, um, especially when things change and, and those relationships or those things end. And so when people's sense of identity is threatened, they argue and defend it. And so oftentimes people will do anything to keep the thing that defines them. And so through understanding attachment, we understand how to get back to ourselves when shit falls apart and shit will fall apart. And hopefully how to get so in tune with ourselves that nothing can threaten our sense of self and our sense of worthiness and identity. And so we begin to control our knowledge instead of the knowledge controlling us. We learn that that job, that house, that car, that child, that spouse, none of those things define you. You are you and you are worthy just as you are. And so Don Miguel Jr. goes into naming and describing the five levels of attachment, and he uses the example of a person who likes soccer. So level one of attachment is the authentic self. This is who you genuinely are. 
And he says a person experiencing this level of attachment can watch a game anywhere in the world. They can watch it in a stadium, in a field, in somebody's living room, in the backyard. And regardless of who wins or loses, when the whistle is blown and the game is over, you move on. You enjoy the moment without any real attachment. You spend that 90 minutes or however long the game is, and then it's over. And you invest just enough to watch or attend the game. And he says this is the most ideal level of attachment where you preserve your energy and you really enjoy experiences for what they are. And so then we move to level two, which is preference. And he says at preference, you can still go to any game in the world, but this time you root for one of the teams. And you realize that if you invest just a little more of yourself into one particular team, then the emotional roller coaster makes the game more fun. He says you decide which team to pick haphazardly. Maybe you like the color of the uniforms or maybe you like the team name or you always pick the home team. Whatever you choose to pick that team, um, you enjoy the game, but you leave it behind when it's over. Although you've invested a small piece of yourself and formed an attachment and you create the story of victory or defeat based on your action and base your actions on that attachment. And so the victory or defeat has nothing to do with you personally. It's about the team. And regardless, you say that was fun. If you know me, you know that when it comes to the Super Bowl, I don't care who's playing. My only team that I'm rooting for is the team that's not the Patriots, because honestly, I'm tired of it. (laughs) And so I go to the Super Bowl. I watch a game. I pick the team that's not the Patriots. I get a little emotional if the Patriots get ahead. But overall, when the game is done, I don't watch football for another year. And so this ability to to attach and detach allows us to invest an emotional side of ourselves where you still enjoy the highs and lows. And life is happening. You're able to enjoy it with other people, regardless of how they see themselves or who they root for. And that's important. Um, The important thing to understand about level two is that here, again, you pick a team, you don't really care, and you ride the game out, and then it's over. And you still respect other people who have differing views because you still see yourself as who you are. And so he goes on to level three, right? And level three is identity. So this time, you are a committed fan of a team. The colors strike an emotional chord inside of you. You feel all the feelings when you see these colors. But you can still go to any game in the world, but there's nothing like seeing the home team, seeing the team that you want to root for. And your team winning or losing partially defines your character now, even after that game is over. If you feel excited when your team wins, then you feel disappointed when they lose. But still somehow your how your team performs is not a condition for self-acceptance. So if you meet a fan of an opposing team, you still see them as a human being. You can watch the game with them and even admit that their team is good. Your feelings and opinions surrounding your team are not a condition by which you relate to others or yourself. This is important. That means them liking something else doesn't determine how you relate to yourself. That's good, right? But at this level, your attachment to your team does affect your personal life. So if they lose, you might have a bad day at work. No matter what that effect is, you have let an attachment change your persona and your attachment bleeds into a world that has nothing to do with it. Level four is internalization. Here, your association with your favorite team is about you. Your team's performance now affects your sense of self and self-worth. When you read the stats, you say the players are making us look bad. Your life and your attachment are so blurred that everything revolves around that team. And you find yourself debating how good your team is outside of the context of the game. So you arguing at the family reunions, you arguing at the bus stop, you arguing at the post post office and you believe anyone who doesn't agree with you is wrong. Your defense is limited to just arguing, but you will still yell and scream at people, which is violent communication. And then you make other people's loyalty to the team a condition of acceptance. That means you only fuck with people who fuck with your team. And then you begin to impose this image onto the other people you interact with every day in life. And this is where um, attachment really starts to get dangerous. When you become 
so attached to this thing or your team or your idea of what's moral or what's immoral that you will not accept people um, because of what they believe and their ideas. And so you begin to impose this image onto other people, right? And so if they don't fit your idea of what a fan should be or what a moral person should be or what a masculine person should be, then you start not accepting people. And this is a level of attachment um, that we really start to see um, society break up and we really start to see Um, microaggressions towards marginalized groups of people. Level five is fanaticism. At this level, you worship the team that you are rooting for. Your blood bleeds their colors. If you see an opposing team, that person is automatically your enemy, no questions asked. And then you can't accept loss as legitimate. If your team loses, you like, "Mm mm-mm, the refs were lying, such and such, um, caught a foul, whatever the case may be. I told y'all I don't watch sports. I don't know. (laughs) But when your team wins a championship, somehow you become a better person. And then you say, well, your family better be fans. And if your kids root for an opposing team, then you put them out of the house. And your family can literally be torn apart if something if somebody turns their back on your team. Every action you take is within the rules of what you think makes a great fan. And you are willing to fight for what you believe in and you will lose respect for everything, including humanity. In your eyes, a true fan will die and kill for their team. And when we believe something without questioning, we are at risk of this greatest level of attachment every time. Please do not believe in accepting things without questioning them, y'all. And there are rare but very real examples of violence at sports stadiums. Some people drive buses into crowds afterwards. You see people fighting at hockey games. And when that attachment is religion, politics, ideas about money, sex, power, gender, then you see numerous examples of people becoming violent as a result of their attachment to these ideas. That attachment forms their identity. And so anything that challenges that, anything outside of that, they then become violent towards. And so at level one, you can go to any church, any mosque, anywhere in the world, and you can experience the presence of God. But at level five, God just happens to be the focus of that religion. But the religion then becomes more important than God. And that is the level, again, level five is where a lot of people um, are at nowadays. We see people being violent towards people in marginalized groups, cultures being violent towards women or people who are non-binary. And this has got to stop, y'all. The world is just got to become a better place. And I think we have the power to make it that. So there's a difference between a person who enjoys and chooses plant-based food and a person who shames you at dinner for eating meat. That person thinks that they're right. Judgment is the tool that they're using. And when you're secure in yourself and who you are, Other people's choices are not a threat to your self-worth. Really think about that. Really think about how much people get in their feelings when somebody tells them pronouns that are different than what they understand them to be, right? And then they let it affect who they are. That is the level of attachment that I seek to break because who somebody decides to be, what they decide to choose for themselves, ultimately should not be a threat to your self-worth. And I think that the goal of this work is to shift your perspective to see what possibilities exist beyond your beliefs and beyond your understanding. And I think the more you do this, the more um, your concept of love and respect will shift as your attachments diminish. The less attached you are, the more you will love people who are different from you or who think differently than you. And the more you are really able to expand your view of the world. Remember, you control the knowledge. The knowledge doesn't control you. And how many good people have you been mean to because they don't believe what you believe? It may not be you, but we've seen people be mean to people because they they fuck with somebody we don't fuck with. Um, Hello, I'm guilty of it. Be mean to people because they don't go to church or shun them because they don't believe what you believe. Think about that and ask yourself, why am I doing this? Am I attached to my idea of who this person should be? I mean, and you call yourself knowing what's best for other people, but really what's best for them doesn't fit your attachment of what you think is best for everybody. 
That is so interesting to me. That was one of those concepts that really had me shook us for a minute. The idea of, and even sin, right? How sin plays into this. My idea of what somebody else should or should not be doing, right? Based on what I think is required to get to heaven or to be a good person or to be a moral person. But really, all of those ideas are based on you. Think about it. We sort of create this image of God based on our image of ourselves. And the more I think we think of ourselves as graceful, accepting, loving creatures, the more we think of God or the universe as accepting accepting and loving and gracious. And so Don Miguel goes into detail of these levels and suggests that we go through each level many times of the day, the way a flower opens and closes. Um, so he says we're, we're constantly at some different levels of this th- attachment throughout our day. And we are always our authentic self, but our attachments make us forget that. And then we forget our harmony with others. And I hope that you all check out this book and I hope it has something to offer you because it was really good for me. And so if you need support through this work or something is striking a chord, please contact me. Um, you can DM me on Instagram at Hayes' Higher Learning. Um, you can send me a message on Facebook at Hayes' Higher Learning. Um, you can log on to AshleyHayes.com slash Hayes' Higher Learning. Hit me up. I want to help you understand this. Um, if it would be helpful for you all t- for me to meet you at a coffee shop or do office hours or do a small workshop or something, let me know because I want to work through attachment of knowledge and really understanding that. Um, authenticity is the goal to be who we are as we are without judging ourselves and others and so remember you can support me at Hayes' Higher Learning via PayPal or Patreon and by supporting Hayes' Higher Learning you make it so I can keep dedicating this time to this work and I can also practice social justice by giving people the tools and the resources they need I would love to help people buy books I would love to help people pay for an hour of therapy or pay for an hour of counseling or life coaching or whatever whatever. So help me support people. I mean, you can learn more about support options at ashleyhayes.com slash Hayes Higher Learning. The song of the week is You Remind Me by Emily King. Thank you so much for tuning in to Hayes Higher Learning, where together we are learning better, doing better, and being better. I hope you all have a wonderful week.